Welcome to the book of Revelation, part 7. We're going to get into the last church that Jesus addresses in the book of Revelation, which is the church at Laodicea. So we're going to pick it up in chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Now that last phrase, the ruler of God's creation, makes perfect sense with the NIV translation, which is what you have here. But when you read the King James Version of where it says the ruler of God's creation, it says this, the beginning of the creation of God. Wow, that sounds completely different than the ruler of God's creation. It almost sounds as if Jesus was the first thing God ever created. Now this is a very critical point. Because if God created Jesus, then Jesus is not God. But the New Testament clearly teaches the divinity of Christ. So what seems to be a contradiction is actually not a contradiction when you understand the Greek. So the Greek word for the word beginning is arche. And it means the beginning, the origin, the person or thing that commences, the first person or thing in a series, the leader that by which anything begins to be, the origin, the active cause. So, this word does not necessarily mean the beginning. It actually has to do with rank. He is the first, or he is the originator. Okay? The ruler, he's in charge. So the NIV actually gets it right. So let me show you some other translations. The Holman Christian Standard Bible says it this way the originator of God's creation, God's word translation, the source of God's creation, the Amplified Bible, the origin and beginning and author of God's creation. So you see, it's not that Jesus was created by God, okay? It's saying that Jesus is the creator, the source of the creation, which is perfectly compatible with other scriptures, by the way. And here is one of those scriptures, Colossians 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And here is John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. I believe Dr. Bullinger did a very good job of explaining this concept in his commentary on the book of Revelation. Here's what he wrote. Before any created thing was formed, Elohim, which is the Hebrew plural word for God, He took created form in order to create so that created beings might hold communion with the Creator, which they could not with God who is spirit. It is only one step to further believe that this form was more permanent, that he took creature form to create, as he afterwards took human form in order to redeem. See, Jesus had his pre-incarnate form. This was the image that all the patriarchs saw. This is the image that Abraham saw. This is the image that Jacob wrestled with, the pre-incarnate Christ the creature form of Almighty God. So when certain denominations try to say, well, Jesus was created, Jesus is not God, well, you can show them Scripture now saying, wait a minute, the Bible says that Jesus created everything. And if He created everything, therefore He must be God. Okay, continuing on in chapter 3. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. What a powerful image here of Jesus spewing water out of his mouth, as in like total disgust. If you've ever tried lukewarm water, I'm sure you would agree that ice cold or even hot would be better. I mean, it's like, please, give me hot tea or give me a tall glass of ice water, but please take the room temperature water back. But this was the spiritual condition of this church. I mean, Jesus was nauseated. It's like, are y'all going to do anything? I mean, be something hot or be totally against me, but this neutral, you're just sitting there doing nothing. 
It's disgusting to me. That's actually how God feels about neutral living. I mean, if you're going to be alive, either live for God or just be completely against Him. But just to live your life as a zombie? Please. When you do a little bit of research about this ancient city, you learn that it was close to Hierapolis, which was a famous city known for its hot springs. So by the time the water flowed to Laodicea, it was no longer hot, it was lukewarm. So Jesus was playing on that when he used this phrase, you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I mean, people in Hierapolis, they're going to sit in the hot springs because it feels good. But do you think anybody was sitting around in lukewarm pools? No. All right, going on in Revelation. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. So when Jesus said to them, you say you are rich, the reason he said that because Laodicea was indeed a very wealthy city. As you can see there in that map, it was located where a lot of roads crossed through it. So a lot of wealth flowed through the city. It was known for its merchants, bankers, uh, medical doctors. Laodicea was also the banking center of Asia. They had an amazing clothing industry because they bred a special type of sheep. They had black wool, and they used this wool because it was shiny and soft, and they were very well known for this. They were also known for making an eye ointment, which uh, people came from far and wide to use, and it obviously had some kind of healing properties. But nonetheless, this is why Jesus said, you should come to me and buy some salve to put on your eyes so you can really see. So he was just simply taking, you know, some things that were going on in their geographical area to make a point. Again, Jesus is a great storyteller. He's a very good communicator. And he just simply took the things that were in their own city so they would get the point. And so there you go. Okay, going on. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person, and they with me. But look at verse 19. How counterintuitive is this? Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline? You know people don't like to be rebuked, and they do not like to be disciplined. But God says that He disciplines and rebukes His children. I recommend you read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. Uh, we're not going to do it here, but that passage explains the concept of why God disciplines those He loves. Okay, so let's finish out the letter to the church at Laodicea. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so now we're going to move on to chapter 4. And we're going to see a vision of heaven. John is going to be taken to heaven and shown the actual throne room where Almighty God sits on His throne. Okay, so here we go. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now believe it or not, this verse of Scripture is used by people who believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. And here is how the argument goes. They say the first three chapters the church is mentioned. After chapter 3, the church is not mentioned anymore. And is it a coincidence that in chapter 4, verse 1, John is so-called raptured to heaven? So therefore, that represents the church getting raptured. Wow, that is amazing. Okay, first of all, why would John represent the whole church? He's one person. Okay, so it's a major stretch to assume that John represents the whole church. So that's not a very good way to form a doctrine. Now, if you've gone through my rapture video, which I just posted before this one, I go into greater detail about this. Okay, so 
I'm not going to rehash that here. If you're interested, go back and watch my Rapture video. But um, I just wanted to point that out because I personally think it's kind of ridiculous to make John represent the whole church. And they say, oh yeah, because see, there's a voice like a trumpet. See, the, the church is raptured when the trumpet blows, as Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Yeah, Paul did mention the trumpet. But did you know that this is a simile that he's using here in Revelation? It says the voice was like a trumpet. It didn't say that this was a trumpet. The rapture, there will be a real trumpet blast. This is something that is being used symbolically. So you really can't use this verse to support a pre-trip rapture. But anyway, let's move on. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald circled the throne. Now notice that John says that someone was sitting on the throne. God is not an alien being. He doesn't look like some weird creature. He actually has a form. He has a spiritual substance. He has an essence to him. He's not just some ethereal uh, force floating around out there. No, he looks like a person. He looks like a man, actually. If you read uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel says, The one who sat upon the throne had the appearance of a man. Okay, so God does not look like those aliens with the big old huge heads and weird beady looking eyes. No, he looks like Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We are created in the image and likeness of God. He looks like a human being. Okay, and he really, I can assure you, does not look like a monkey. And here's another thing that John mentions. He says the one that was sitting on the throne had the appearance of jasper and ruby. Again, now he wasn't saying that God was a jasper or a ruby. He was saying he had the appearance like, again, a simile. Just like we talked about the voice that sounded like a trumpet not being a real trumpet. It's the same concept here. John is simply saying that God was emitting light that was reddish like a jasper, and a ruby. And then John says that he saw what looked like an emerald-colored rainbow circling the throne. Now John is doing the best he can here. I mean, he's given a vision here of God Almighty sitting on his throne in the heavenly throne room. And he's seeing brilliant light like he's never seen before. And in human terms, he's trying to describe the divine essence of Almighty God, that spiritual essence that is His life energy. It is His glory. And His glory is only known and shared in the Trinity among the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But God extended the reality of His glory to His children, those who are born again and brought into the family of God through Christ Jesus. We inherit this glory. Now, I'm not going to get into that too much now, but I did devote seven videos to the glory of God in quantum physics. And I talked about everything from quarks to string theory to quantum miracles, why God emits light. Fascinating stuff, in my opinion. So I, I highly recommend that you go check out those videos. If you've ever wondered why God emits light, you know, every time He shows up in the Bible, there's brilliant light. I explain that. There's a reason for that. God emits a field of glory. And from this energy field, all of reality manifests. And we as Christians also have a field of glory radiating from our being. Of course, it is invisible light that we can't see. But it has healing power. It has power to do a lot of stuff. Okay, It's called the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It is the presence of God. It is a field of energy flowing out of our spirit. And I explain how all of that works in that seven-part series. So go check it out. All right, let's continue in Revelation. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. So who were these 24 elders? Well, we really don't know for sure. But some say that 12 of them are the apostles. 
But uh, it's kind of hard to see how that could be if John, being one of those apostles, is there right now in the Spirit seeing this vision. So then you have to ask yourself, well, was he seeing himself there in a future state? That's something for you to really think about. You know, and maybe it's possible. I don't know. But there are 24 elders. The most logical explanation is that there are 24 great leaders, men of God, from the Old or New Testament. I don't know. But I'm sure we'll find out when we get there. Okay, going on. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. So John sees flashes of lightning and hears peals of thunder, which is very, very similar to what the children of Israel witnessed when God descended on Mount Sinai. Now, we've already talked about the seven spirits that are before the throne. So I'm not really going to go that much into it. But just remember that, in my opinion, these seven spirits do not represent the sevenfold Holy Spirit. I believe they are seven angels. And angels are very often called spirits. So you can go back and watch my older videos to pick up on that. All right, Revelation 4. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes, in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was, and is, and is to come. So this vision that John is seeing is actually exactly like what Isaiah saw hundreds of years before. He wrote, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy! is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. So John was seeing exactly what Isaiah saw. But John called these things that were flying around the throne four living creatures. Isaiah called them seraphim. So Isaiah actually identified them as angelic beings with the rank of seraphim. And notice what they say constantly. They say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Why do you think they say holy, holy, holy three times? Because of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because all three are holy. So what about these creatures that are around the throne with six wings and they got these weird looking faces and they've got eyes all over their bodies? What in the world could this be? Well, first of all, we need to remember that there are very, very strange looking creatures right here on planet Earth. I mean, look at an octopus. I mean, they're very common and we've seen them before, so I guess we've kind of been desensitized. But imagine seeing one of those for the very first time. I mean, it looks like an alien creature. And look at a praying mantis. I mean, that is a very weird-looking creature. So God is very creative. He makes a lot of interesting-looking things. So we shouldn't find it uh, mind-boggling that there are these weird-looking creatures in heaven. God has created weird-looking creatures here. But if you do some research, you're going to hear a bunch of different theories about what these four beasts represent, these faces. Uh, one of them is you'll hear, you know, in Numbers chapter 2, the way the tribes of Israel camped around the tabernacle. And how each of these uh, groupings would have a certain flag, a standard that represented who they were. And on each of these flags, you had the same faces that are on these living creatures. And some would say, well, there's no coincidences in the Bible. And I, I agree with that. So, you know, you can do your research there and look into that if you want to. But let's move on. Chapter 4, verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne 
and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So have you ever wondered how in the world these living creatures, for all eternity, can just say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty? I mean, don't they get bored after a while? How many millions or billions of years have they been doing this? I mean, wouldn't you go batty doing this for eternity? Well, think about it this way. I heard somebody say one time that the reason these creatures say holy, holy, holy forever is because every time they make a circle around that throne, they see a new facet of God's glory. They see a, a new dimension of His greatness. So it's not that they're just programmed robots saying holy, holy, holy. It's more like every time they come around, they just can't help but say, holy, 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 in complete amazement at what they're seeing. They're peering into the glory of Almighty God, and they cannot fathom what they're seeing. It's just unbelievable. So, for all eternity, these creatures are in amazement at what they're seeing. That should tell you how glorious, how amazing, how powerful God is. And what's even more amazing, these 24 elders, they do, every time they hear these beasts say, holy, 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 they fall down on their faces. They throw their crowns at his feet and they worship him. Not just once, not just twice, but every single time. That's how worthy God is of our praise and worship. He is so holy. He is so amazing. He's increasing. He's becoming more. He's becoming better and better, believe it or not. And so when those four living creatures come around and see him, they are like, wow, he's even better. He's, he's even more glorious. So that they just can't help themselves. And we won't be able to either. When we get to heaven and we see God in all of his glory, it will take us an eternity to even blink. Because when we look at him for the first time, we will be in such amazement that the only thing we will be able to say is just holy, holy, holy. Nothing else will matter at that moment. Nothing else will be more beautiful, more glorious than looking at our Father in heaven, who, by the way, shares his glory with his children. Wow, these living creatures, they can't get up in that glory. They can only peer into it in amazement. But see, we are going to be seated with Christ Jesus on his throne, and we're going to be up in that glory, sharing in that glory that no other creature in heaven or earth will be able to share. Only us, only the children of God, get this wonderful inheritance. Well, that concludes part seven of our series on the book of Revelation. I appreciate you watching these videos, and those of you who subscribe to my channel, I really appreciate that. And video eight will be coming very soon. God bless.